book of the uh, Gospel of John, chapter 13. And what I want to do is, I want to, we, last class we were talking about Jesus as our example, as opposed to Jesus as the fulfillment of it, or we use the terminology, Jesus as representative and realization. <clears throat> But we were talking about Jesus as an example and being our example and how people have held on to that and made that something. <clears throat> Let me make a statement that might shock you a little bit. And that is, in the New Testament, there are only two scriptures that mention Jesus being our example. Does that shock anybody? I mean, wouldn't you think there'd be a whole lot more? There's only two scriptures. And uh, I want to examine them and uh, just take a little look at, at that. Um, the first one is in John chapter 13. This is the only one in the Gospels. And then there's one in the New Testament, I mean in the epistles. Um, and this is dealing with, uh, right after the Lord's Supper, with what some people call foot washing. And uh, <clears throat> let's just start at verse 2. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Isn't it interesting that Judas didn't just come up with the idea to betray Jesus, that Satan put it in his heart? <clears throat> Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, meaning he's, he's not worried about being equal with God. He knows where he comes from. He knows his Father. Um, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. And after he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered and saith unto him, What I do thou knowest not, <clears throat> thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. And Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. <laughs> and Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. And Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not except to wash his feet, but is entirely clean, and ye are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, you are not all clean. He knew who should be, he's talking about Judas. He's talking about the dirty feet is not part of you except that part of the body that's messed up. He's saying, I don't need to wash you, Peter. I need to wash that part of the body that is Judas. It's clear as day if you just read the context straight, straight through. So after he had washed their feet and taken his garments and was seated again, he said unto them, Know ye not what I have done unto you? Uh, and of course, this is unto you all. Uh, ye call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so am I, or so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you, here it is, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. Verily I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that sent is sent greater than he that sent him. <clears throat> All right. When people talk about Jesus being our example and we ought to follow his example, they get into every kind of thing that you would imagine. <clears throat> okay. Jesus or the, the two scriptures in the whole New Testament that refer to, the, to following the example of Jesus, both are exactly the same category of thing. They have nothing to do with copying Jesus' miracles or his ministry style or uh, any of those things that we get into, that we, we're going to copy Jesus in this area and that area. We're going to do, do it the way Jesus did it and all that. There's not one scripture that tells you to do anything the way Jesus did it, except these two areas, and, and the other one's over in 1 Peter, and we'll look at it in a minute. 
but they are both areas that have nothing to do with copying actions, but copying attitudes, how you deal with situations. And they are both how you deal with people that are messed up or that stuff like that. In this case, the, the foot washing, there is no, we're not supposed to copy foot washing. We're not supposed to institute it into the church. That's not what he's talking about. That's not the example he's given. The example he's given is the body is clean. All of you are okay. All, he's, he's looking at them. He's saying, you're the body. There's 11 of you. You're all okay. There's one of you that's dirty. He's, part, he's still considered part of the body. Jesus still considered him part of the body because he's washing the feet of the body. Amen? And we say, well, no, no, they messed up or they, they're not part of the body because they breached. They, did, they don't believe this doctrine or they did this wrong or they did that wrong. Let me tell you, I don't know that it gets any worse than letting Satan come in your heart and betraying Jesus. I don't know that it gets any worse than betraying the Son of God. But Jesus is girding himself and getting down and he's washing their feet in representation of and let me read it again so that you can make sure that you get this um, Simon, in verse 9 Simon Peter saith unto him Lord not my feet only but also my hands and my head now why would Peter say why would he make that statement why well, Jesus told us why in verse 7, what I do, thou knowest not. Uh, and he said, but thou shalt know hereafter. But right now, you don't know what I'm doing. Well, if you're, you know, Peter's, what is Peter doing? He's doing the typical thing. He hasn't entered into kenosis. He hasn't embraced oneness in the true sense of that, not the doctrinal sense. The true sense, because let me tell you something. God's not interested about your doctrinal stance. He don't care what you've embraced doctrinally. He wants to know what's real, what's life in you. He wants to know what comes by relationship with him. You can have, the Pharisees had better doctrinal stance than you did, and they totally missed Jesus, okay? I'm telling you that he doesn't, you know, you say, well, you got a Bible school. You, surely you're, you know, trying to get us all, doctor, getting all of our doctrinal ducks in order care about Donald Duck or doctrinal ducks. I don't care. I care about Christ being formed in you. I care about you having a true union and relationship that flows by life. And if it doesn't, it's just a bunch of stuff somebody taught you. And why would I want to do that? Why would I set up a place just to, just to talk? You know, maybe I like the sound of my own voice. I hate the sound of my own voice. I... Usually when Deb plays a tape in the house, I can't stand here. And I'm so thankful I'm upstairs now. You know, and I don't have to hear that garbage. I don't want to hear me. And I don't want you to hear me. I want us to hear the Lord, to really hear the Lord, to walk with the Lord and to know the Lord and to move with the Lord and be so in tune with him that we're truly arms and hands and extensions of Jesus. That's what he wants more than anything that I would ever want. It. And the little bit of desire I have in me comes from his life that is within me. And so Peter doesn't understand. He thinks separate. He, he moves separate. He, he looks at the situation. And he goes, no, he's, he's only thinking of me, me in my corporal sense, my physical body, me. And he goes, well, you know, if you're going to wash me, don't just wash my feet because I'm a mess all over. And he goes, no, you're washed. You're clean. I have declared you clean. But we have somebody in our midst that's heart is not right. And we need to not, you know, Jesus didn't get down and drive a nail into his feet. You know. He got down and washed it. And he washed it. He could have well said, every time he took one of, one of the disciples' feet, okay, Judas, I'm going to love you and caress you and wash you. Do you understand? Jesus, that's the example. Not washing feet. 
But when somebody is wrong, dead wrong, incredibly wrong, you know, but what do we do? When somebody's wrong, when they're dead wrong, when they've done something horribly wrong, we turn on them. We, we want to destroy them. Well, this ain't right. Jesus never looked at Judas and said, this ain't right. When Judas betrayed him with a kiss, he said, friend, betrayest thou me with a kiss? You know? He, you know, but we turn on them. We use whatever faults and whatever things that we can find, and we rip them apart. And you know what's funny? Is we have people that say, well, you don't, you know, here we go. You don't show any love, Scott. Well, what if Scott actually didn't show any love? Then we should show love to Scott. We shouldn't go, Scott doesn't, Scott doesn't show any love. I don't hang out with Scott because Scott doesn't show any love. Do you understand what I just said? We're doing the same thing there. We're not showing love. We're not washing his feet. We're not ministering to him. We're just pointing out wrong. You know, I mean, you know, God, God didn't make us fruit inspectors. He made us sons of God in the image of Christ. He made us to, to lay down our life for one another, for, for the, uh, the uncomely, for the ungodly, for the needy, for the lacking, for the ugly, for the hurting, for the worst. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. That's what he did. And you know what? Have you ever noticed how some of the worst people are in the church and some of the best people won't join? Come on, anybody ever notice that? How some of the worst people are in the church and the best people, you know, I remember a uh, uh, long time ago, what was the statement? Uh, good people are going to hell and bad people are going to heaven. I think I made that somewhere a long time ago and everybody got mad at me. I said, what? Sure. Good, you know, bad people are going to heaven, that's what I said, and good people are going to hell. Well, folks, the bad people recognize their need for Christ, and they come and they get forgiveness. The good people are too good, and so I'm better than you, and it becomes an issue of corporalness, just individuality, just like Peter. No, 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 if you're going to wash my feet, wash all of me. And Jesus could well have said, I'm not talking about you in your individual state, Peter. Come on. Get with the true reality. I mean, this is... Folks, when they leave this supper, when they leave it, he's heading to the garden. And then the cross. The garden, the judgment hall, and then the cross. This is one of his last acts before he goes there. And, you know, this example is an example of life of his life, of his kind of life, of this new humanity life, of this new creation life. It is an example of the way that he is and that if you have his life, follow the example by the life. Did you follow that? You see what the example is, don't try to copy it. Follow the example by the life because you've been joined to the same life that washes Judas. That loves the people that are messed up. You know, I, I, I remember when we were all over on Maple Street when we started opening the homeless shelter, and I remember we, we had the back pew and it seemed like half of the next one full of homeless people that would come on Sunday. And pretty soon, all of the people with money started leaving our church. Did you know that? Some of you didn't know that. Yes. You were the, yeah, you knew that. They, they left our church because why? Well, I asked one of them. He said, well, man, those people stink. They smell. They smell really bad. And, you know, I was tempted to say, they don't smell any worse than you do, but I didn't. <laughs> But there is, there is 
this attitude that stinks, that, that turns out the outcast, that turns out when, you know, the, the, turns out the one who's wrong, that is messed up and everything. I'm telling you, I know for a fact Jesus loved Judas and he loved him to the end and he was trying through every means possible to reach him, not to condemn him and not to expose him. You want to follow an example? You want to live after an example? <laughs> there it is. Well, here, here's the people that just follow Jesus as an example. Well, you don't follow his example, so I condemn you. <laughs> Anybody getting that? That's ridiculous. You're not following his true example because he never said follow his example on, on doing miracles or follow his example on, on uh you know, driving out the money changers. Even though he did that, he never said, the Bible never pointed to follow the example on those. We say we need to follow his example, and we pick whatever we want to pick and say this is what we should do. But the Bible has two examples and two alone that it says, make sure the life in you conforms in this manner. All right, let's go to the other one. Um, First Peter. And, you know, I can pretty much tell you that I'll get in trouble for what some of the things I'm saying. I mean, honestly, you'd be surprised. You would be surprised how many people listen to this stuff, <laughs> go to the website and get it. You'd be surprised. But you'd also be surprised. I mean, we got a good one tonight. Mallory got one, and it seemed real positive. But, you know, you would be surprised. And yet, all that I am saying, not complicated, all I am saying is it must be Christ in us I'm lifting up Christ above us as the source. That's all I'm saying. You say, well, that's a good way to get condemned because they condemn Christ. And if you're going to get in his corner, yeah, but, you know, if I'm going to be condemned, I'd rather be condemned because in the face of my frailties, I am going after God with all I know to do. And you should too. Period. All right, First Peter, chapter two, and verse twenty-one. <coughs> well, you really can't get the gist of it. Uh, how about, gosh, how about seventeen? Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king, honor the. I mean, love the brotherhood. Someday I'm going to really share on that. Love the brotherhood, man. I don't think we get it. Love that we are in a brotherhood. And we need to love this brotherhood. We need to thank God we're in it. We need to thank God that if we're not in it, we're going to be wandering around in the noontime as if it were dark, trying to figure out what this thing's all about. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the perverse. Now, of course, if a master is not good and gentle, we will condemn them to the other servants. And he's saying don't do that. He's saying don't do that. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. This is wrong. This is not fair. He says, well, this is sort of a thankworthy thing if you can handle this in the right spirit. But maybe, maybe we can't. And, of course, it says endure grief. I mean, you know what, you know what it is to, to, go, to have grief. And yet to have to endure it, but no, not have to endure it. There is a spirit. There is a nature. There is a life 
And so he goes on. For what glory is it if when you are buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, meaning he never did anything wrong, neither was there any guile found in his mouth, who, but when, reviled, when he was reviled, reviled not. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. All right, so here again, uh, the, the picture that I get is Jesus knowing this is my last day on earth in this body. This is my last day. This is my last day. And I know that Judas has already got, you know, turned on me. I know that he's actually opened his heart to the devil. I mean, think, put yourself in this situation. I know he's already opened his heart to the devil. And I am going to be incredibly badly treated by everybody around me. And I'm fixing to have a meal with it. <laughs> now, I know that we think that that meal was this big long table and they all sat on one side. But, but you'd never do that. Have you ever noticed like in movies and stuff that they'll have two or three guys sitting like this talking, you know, but they're facing out this way. You know, it's, it's camera stuff. You can't, you don't normally, you know, put everybody in the right position that they're supposed to be in. That was uh, Michelangelo, wasn't it, who did that? So it's, yeah, come on, folks. Pardon? Oh, was it Da Vinci? Da Vinci. It might have been. Anyway, um, and so, and so they, you know, when you put like six people at a table, you can see people a little better and stuff. Look at them in the face and stuff. Have you ever known somebody was literally, eventually, or soon, going to turn on you and go say a bunch of stuff and do a bunch of stuff against you and you still treated them with love and respect? I mean, just flat out knew it. And still would not say bad stuff about them not say bad stuff about them. They say bad about you. Not say bad stuff about them. Not do it. Not do it. Well, only Christ does that. Only this new humanity, only this new creation, only this new man will do that. And so, you know, because it's telling us he left us an example that you should follow in his steps but there's a little trick to this because before he ever made this statement in chapter 1 and verse 23, he says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever for all flesh is grass. And he goes into this whole thing and he points out that all flesh, all first humanity is grass and is the glory of man is nothing and it'll fade away. But you must be born again of incorruptible seed. Well, what's incorruptible seed? Christ. He's the only seed that is not corruptible. You can't corrupt him. You can corrupt you. You can corrupt you and you and you and you and you. You can't corrupt Jesus. Hmm? Now, wait a minute. The, the people thought he was corrupt. He, for he deceiveth the people. That was one of the things they said about Jesus. For he deceiveth the Oh, no, but he deceiveth the people. Oh, no, he, but anything that's born of fornication, that's what they said of Jesus. You know, there's that stuff, and there's this and that. That seed is incorruptible. You may fail. You may get forgiveness. You may get that under the blood. Our goal is to conform to the image of Christ. 
not just to try to copy these things that only the lamb will do. Because you can't get any more frustrated than trying to copy this incorruptible seed. It's, it's an impossible task. It will drive you crazy. You will go, I just, you will, you know, you're supposed to get so down on yourself that you say, oh, wretched man that I am. I mean, really, it literally is to bring you to that. It is to bring you almost to the point of insanity. It's to bring you down where you doubt yourself. But it is not to destroy you. Cast down but not forsaken. It is that at your lowest point, you recognize, you know what? That cross looks awful good. I am crucified with Christ. I'll take the new incorruptible seed. I'm going to start living by Christ. I don't want, you know, it's like with all my heart, I don't want to be the way that I am. But I'm going to quit trying to change the way I am, and I'm going to start believing. Because after all, what is the New Testament? What is your only part in the New Testament? Faith. Is that right? Faith. But it's not what we call faith. We, we call faith, okay, I, I'm believing for that. Okay, I'm going to believe that. You know, and when it doesn't go our way, we go, what? You said if you believe, and I believe, and then people quit God. Well, you didn't have true faith. Because true faith embraces, well, the just shall live by faith. You live by this reality that you're crucified and Christ is your life. I mean, Paul said that. He said, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me. In the life, still in the same verse, not a break, not a, not a period and a new sentence, still just one and the life. I now live in the flesh. In the flesh, I live by faith. Are, are, are you getting that? I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me so that I would be crucified with Christ so that I would not live. That's what it says. That's what it means. Yes. Amen. All right. So here it's saying, follow his example. Only in one other place it says that. So let me just read my little paragraph. The example is this specific example, not just following generally examples of Christ. These follow these specific examples, not just to do miracles or do prayer, but do by my nature or do the things of the Lamb. Because those are the only two examples it gave. And those are the only two times it said, follow this. You know, think of all it could have said to follow his example. Come on. Think of the myriad of, of, of possibilities it could have laid on you. And it only laid things of nature, not things of ministry. And that's pretty amazing. Um, these are not natural to us. Things of nature, things of this nature are not natural to us. Why? Because we are selfish. The way you stop doing selfish things is not by just turning from them. Selfishness demonstrates itself in actions. Do you agree with that? Selfishness demonstrates itself in actions, but it is not the action, but the character or the fallen nature that's the issue. Does that make sense? Okay. Just try to copy Jesus in these ways and see what happens. Now, I have a whole list of scriptures that I was going to go through to show you that the scriptures are clearly declaring that we must live by Christ. But I'm not going to get into that right now. And as a matter of fact, um, I think... What I'm going to do, and this is for people listening to this who are just get on the web and, and um, 
listen to classes and stuff, you can, you can shut off your player at this point if you want to. There's still more to learn and everything. But, but for sure what I'm going to do is, is right now start going over some of the test. Okay? Is that good? So you'll know what's going to be on the test. Also, for those that are in this class that don't take the test, this, there's still good stuff here. There's still some good stuff. All right, in what scriptures do you find the main theme of the kenosis of Christ? See, I don't need you to raise your hand or people that are graduated 20 years ago. I need, I need students that are now in this class. Where is the, the main scripture, really the only scripture that talks about the kenosis of Christ? Where is it? Philippians. Good girl. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. And see, you're the kind of people I want to be able to answer this. And, and if you can't answer it right now, get this stuff down, write it down, and study it. And if that doesn't work, write it on your arm and come in with a long sleeve shirt. Do something <laughs> for God's sake. <clears throat> All right, number two, the word kenosis means what? Self-emptying. Self uh, you could also say, say self-limiting, but we've really, really talked about self-emptying. Um, I don't know that we really discussed this one in this particular class. What outward things did Jesus subject himself unto? Well, he subjected himself to his parents, to fatigue, to hunger, to temptation. Right? I mean, those were things that he was not subject to beforehand. I, so, parents, fatigue, hunger, temptation. All right, the next one is the thought behind the kenosis of Christ is related to the Son of God or the Son of Man? Which one? Son of Man. In his, incarna in his incarnation, did Jesus possess divine attributes? A anybody can answer, raise your hand, but anybody can answer now. Did Jesus possess divine attributes in his, Scott? Yes. Yes, he did. <clears throat> Number six, were the miracles of Jesus proof that he was divine? Mallory? No. What? Did y'all hear that? That would go against most Bible schools. His, the miracles he did didn't prove he was divine. It proved that God the Father was in him and at work. I'm giving the test now in case you missed that. Okay. Um, okay, what was, what was it that Jesus made himself? He made himself of no reputation. You know, most, of, not most of this, but I'd say half of what we've already gone through is found in Philippians 2 there. <laughs> so if you, if you just sort of familiarize yourself with that. Um, the obedience of Christ was all the way unto what? What? Death of the cross. Death of the cross. Very good. <clears throat> and again, that's there in Philippians 2. What was God's intention in creating man? Scott, you ought to know this one because you answered it in the very first class when I... What was God's intention in creating man? To make him in his own image after his likeness. God's intention for making man. To make him in his own image after his likeness. In other words, all that man became after the fall was nothing even close to what God had in mind when he created man and what he wanted man to be. All right, number 10, describe the two alternatives for recovering God's plan. One was to restore fallen man back to where he was. And the other part of that plan is to have a new creation through Christ as man. And the good news, students, if you don't write everything down, you might be able to get the tape and listen to it later on, and it'll have everything on it. Now, that doesn't mean you stop writing. <laughs> that doesn't mean you don't keep doing this, but, you know, just know that. All right, the next one is, what is the negative side of a Jesus 
of Nazareth mentality. All right. That's something that every one of you should understand when we refer to around here as a Jesus of Nazareth mentality. Apart from a test, apart from a course, this is, this is one of those things that you need to have in your arsenal. Okay, it's that we, a Jesus of Nazareth mentality, that we relate to Jesus the way he, uh, uh, the way he did when he ministered on earth to fallen humanity. We begin to seek help, seek for help apart from the cross and want God to divinely intervene. We seek him only for help or for blessing. Okay, that means that we ignore the cross. You know, the cross happened after the Gospels. Can't get an amen from somebody. After the Gospels, when Jesus rose, he rose in a completely different being, completely different creation than he was before. In what way is the only begotten son different from the new man? As only begotten, Jesus was the only one of the new humanity. He was the only seed of its kind. He was a single seed. As new man, he is a corporate being. We are now his body. That one's probably a pretty good one to have in your arsenal since it's foundational. Next one, what did the cross mean for the old humanity? Well, I dealt with that one tonight, either in the first class tonight or the second one. What did the cross mean for the old humanity? It meant that there was no more dealing with the old humanity. It had failed, and the cross shows how God felt about it. It was not a means of blessing man, but of removing this humanity. It meant death. Now, you know, that's an interesting one because we look at the cross and think it's God's instrument of blessing when it's God's instrument of curse upon our humanity apart from Christ and apart from living by the life of Christ. But we go, oh, we wear them around our neck. You know, I mean, and I have no problem with that. I mean, every once in a while I'll wear something like that. But I mean, that's, you know, to not understand that that cross is not a blessing. It is the, it is the ultimate end of everything you were in your first humanity and to walk around with that and not live that way and then stand before God he'll probably let one thing pass through he'll let you stand before him with steel having that thing and go now what does that mean oh it means you blessed us and you really love us and go no I cursed you and I really hate you in this first humanity and I put it to death is that what that means yes it is all right, what does it mean to be identified with the resurrected Jesus? It means to no longer look at yourself as you were before the cross, but to see yourself in Christ. As branch, to draw from the life of the vine. When the scripture speaks of Jesus after the resurrection, to always include myself, to reckon my old man dead. See, I told you, some of you that aren't taking the test. There's still some good stuff in here. Squeezing the grapes, squeezing the grapes. Yeah, Scott? I was talking about God's mentality towards the whole humanity, and I was just kind of snickering on the way up here because it's like, you know, the Bible says that God is love. Well, he, he would. That's right. He would bomb. And what bomb would he use? Nuss bomb. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. What is spiritual maturity according to Ephesians 4, 11 through 13? <clears throat> These scriptures first mention perfection, perfecting and being equipped as saints, but finishes with the maturity of the whole body, the new man. This maturity is found in everyone knowing the life in them, which is the nature of the Son, and the union with him and everyone else is all, are all in the new man. <clears throat> Here's a good one. What is the difference between the resurrected church and the religious church? The religious church is identified by rituals, rules, ordinances, ways of ceremony. It is an external thing. The resurrected 
church is the body of Christ and is here to manifest in a corporate way the life of Christ. Now let me, let me explain to you that on the test, you don't have to say exactly what I'm saying here. Okay, there's not, a, it's not like you have to, just give me the gist of it. You understand what I'm saying? Put it in your own words. It doesn't have to be 10 paragraphs or whatever. It just, I just need to know that you have some clue of why you came to Acts Bible School. Okay, this is just, that, it's simple, you know. <clears throat> All right. What is the difference between Jesus being the representative and the realization? Wow, we actually got into that one. He was the representative of the kind of behavior and attitudes the Father would like in man. He was this as the only begotten Son. As such, he was our example. But then he became the resurrected new man. This man was the realization of what God had in mind for man. Only in this man could we reach the potential of what Jesus of Nazareth Nazareth only represented. Okay, I said all of that. It took me an hour, but, you know, there's the paragraph. <laughs> Next one, what is the contrast of the two kinds of men described in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22, and 45 and 47? Well, it simply states this. All in Adam die, but all in Christ shall be made alive. The first man was of the earth and earthy, but the second man is the Lord from heaven. He is the Lord from heaven. I thought he... Never mind. <clears throat> All right, here's a, here's a good one that you can wax eloquent on. Tell us about the mystery. So I was, I was always good at these kind of questions. I would make it sound like I knew what I was talking about and use words and I would weave this thing that said nothing but sounded like I was a genius. <clears throat> God always planned that through Jesus there would be the kind of man that God wanted. He didn't make it known at creation or until the church began. The mystery is Christ in us and we in Christ as the body of Christ. So when I say, tell us about the mystery, I'm not talking about Gnosticism. All right, and finally the last one, what were the two stages of Jesus' ministry? The first was the three and a half years of exposing the first humanity for what it was. It was vicious, weak, and selfish. You could do it, you could do it only good, and it would rebel and kill you. That's exposing the first humanity for what it was. Jesus came down here and he exposed. Let me tell you, the cross was the perfect way of showing what's really in man. That they'll turn, they'll attack you, they'll rip you to shreds. And Jesus only meant them good. And only did them good, really. Um, all right, so that's the first part. The st second stage was found at the cross where it put that humanity away in order to bring a new and better race. Better because it's filled with Christ. <laughs> with my little notes here, I just now noticed this. I didn't notice it before until right this second. It says, discussion before the test. <clears throat> How many looked at or studied my book in preparation for the test? I don't know that I have a Kenosis book. The point of the class is for you to take good notes, not for you to study my material. So there, there you have it. <laughs> Didn't want you to study my book anyway. Just wanted you to take good notes, and not good notes from me, but to hear from what the Holy Spirit is saying. The second thing I wrote is graduation is dependent upon completing the courses. If you fail, you will have to take this class again. However, if you fail this class and your heart is after Jesus, you hadn't failed God at all. 
you know, I know some of you are thinking, well, the director shouldn't be saying that. <laughs> yeah, I, I should. I, I created this place as a place to learn Christ. Now, I do believe that if you'll apply yourself, you will both have a heart after God and actually make good grades. And here's why I say that. When I was in school, this was both high school and college courses that I took. My grades were terrible. I, was all, I always had horrible grades. But when I got in Bible school, my grades were A's and B's. Yeah, mostly A's. You know why? I didn't care about passing a course or passing a test, but I was so hungry for Jesus, I was sucking up the material and going after the Lord. All right. Um, uh, this is also for the test, and I'll probably have somebody remind you this. You may write on the back of the paper if more room is needed. I'm not impressed with big handwriting that takes up a lot of space. In other words, there's that much space. And so instead of writing a whole lot, you just have big letters that fill in the gap, you know, like, I love Jesus, like, that, like that's going to do it, okay? You know, in big letters, wow, I'm impressed with that. But this says right here, I'm not. <laughs> I'm interested in content. Give us full an explanation for each answer. Don't give the same answer over and over for each question. And I'll tell you where I came up with that. Previous test. Here is the common answer. Like saying that 15 different ways. I see right through all of that, okay? <clears throat> when you finish, you may turn in the test and be dismissed from the class. Do not make noise outside the classroom. In other words, when you take Okay. Actually, I'm not. You have to be here the night, the New Year's Eve. And then, of course, put your name at the top of the paper and begin. I am probably not going to be here next week. Either my wife or somebody else is going to give this test. Somebody that's very educated and important. Someone outside of the church. Someone outside of the church. All right. Are we good? No. <laughs> I like that. All right. We're dismissed. That's the right answer.